Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for your patience as we got started today. We are continuing on with Health Month, and today we're going to be talking about structural heart procedures, latest techniques and technologies. I have somebody that I love to have, you know, speak for us, and that is Dr. Thomas Wagner. I want to let you know a little bit about Dr. Wagner. He is a structural, structural interventional cardiologist with Pima Heart and Vascular, as well as the director of the Structural Heart and Cardiovascular Research Center at Tucson Medical Center. Dr. Wagoner is, a board cert, is board certified in internal medicine, adult echocardiography, vascular medicine interpretation, nuclear cardiology, and cardiovascular medicine. He specializes in coronary, coronary artery disease, vascular disease, and heart valve disorders. Dr. Wagner performs cutting edge, minimally invasive transcatheter heart valve replacements and other minimally invasive procedures. He is a local leader in this field and he has a passion for getting the job done and treating patients as a whole person. I know you have a lot more to share, Dr. Wagner, but I wanna welcome you for being here today. So, <laughs> Thank you, Michael, um, a very kind introduction. Thank you very much. And thanks everybody for coming. We appreciate your time today. I know Jeopardy's on, so we'll make it quick. <laughs> So I'm going to go ahead. Um, you do have an online audience watching with us, and I'm going to put your PowerPoint up so that you can get started. If you have a question for Dr. Wagoner, please put them in the chat, and I will ask those questions afterwards. Excellent. Again, Maya, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Dr. Wagoner, Director of Structure Heart at TMC, Director of Cardiovascular Research at Pima Heart and TMC, as well as a Director of Two Fellowships. So We've had a tremendous amount of growth over the last about eight years, and a lot of it's just been program building. So I don't know if you guys know, but we actually have a structural heart fellowship, which is a PGY-8. So this person goes to med school for four years, internal medicine for three years, general cardiology for three years, interventional cardiology for a year, and then structural interventional cardiology, which is what I specialize in for their PGY-8 year. So it's 15 years of training to get to this point. Wow. So hopefully you know what we're talking about. Um, that being said, we have a research fellowship as well, as well as two research programs. And uh, I'd love to introduce my colleague up here. He's been phenomenal. Thank you, sir, for joining us. And uh, he's part of our Pima Heart program, a representation from the TMC program as well. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and uh, talk about a lot of new techniques that we're doing at TMC, particularly transcatheter valves. Next slide. <coughs> Do I have answer to your question? Perfect. My disclosures, you know, it's really exciting because our program, again, has really had a tremendous amount of growth. And by growth, I mean volume, good outcomes, and cutting edge technology. Okay. When you have a program, you have to have certain pillars in place to ensure that you're doing the best you can for your patients. So we are one of the best programs in the state, the best program in Tucson, and actually one of the top programs in the entire country for structural heart, again, which is catheter-based heart valve interventions, including stents. Obviously, TMC is our, our uh, you know, phenomenal hospital-based program that we do all this work. And it's been voted one of the best hospitals by US News and World Report two years in a row. So in 2021 and 2022, then 22 to 23. So we're really proud to help develop this. I think a lot of this is really born on the back of research, right? When you bring research, you bring new device technology, you bring new therapies, you bring new, new medications from the pharma industry. So that allows us to treat patients on a broader spectrum with also tailored therapies. It's not one size fits all. It's not one valve that fits everybody's anatomy. It's not one medication that's gonna treat you. So the tailored therapy, I think, is really driven on the back of research. That's really what we've been about the last uh, eight years. I'm uh, part of Pima Heart and Vascular, which is now US Heart and Vascular. We collaborate tremendously well with TMC and, and uh, have really grown the program. Um, so we have a clinical trials. So I'll do a clinical trial overview for our office-based research program and then the hospital-based research program. The office base is uh, is growing. Uh, you know, we're about 30, 35 clinical trials now. And uh, we're really starting to do a lot of the, the heart failure medications, uh, lipids, you know, cholesterol-derived medications, high blood pressure, vascular disease, we're really growing that space. Here's a list of the office-based clinical trials. And it's a busy slide, but it just shows you that if you have a problem in cardiology, 
by and large, we probably have a, a new device or new therapy to treat. All right. We have conventional therapies, including open heart surgery, catheter based stents. There's a whole new wave of technology. Where we're trying to marry technology with clinical practice. And cardiology is at the forefront of that to offer the smallest miniature technique, incision, catheter based, lowest risk of a complication therapy, right? With the newest technology. So these are some of the trials. Again, heart failure, cholesterol, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. What's exciting about this is, again, we want to tailor therapy, not one size fits all in medicine. And this is really, this really resonates, particularly in cardiology and structural heart. Shifting gears to the hospital-based program, we have, uh, again, a, a plethora of clinical trials. I'm going to focus on, on some valve-related issues, uh, mitral valves particularly, and then a procedure called a watchman, which is very fit. Um, the hospital-based clinical uh, trials, I'll show you some of, of the things that we're involved in. So of these valve trials, we'll, we'll look at the, for example, the red, uh, first red one, Align AR. So that is a TAVR valve. That's a transcatheter aortic valve implantation. We, do, we go through the groin, put a new valve in your aorta. It takes about one hour. They go home usually within 24 hours. Versus conventional open surgery, which is open chests. You're in the hospital for five to seven days or longer, particularly in the ICU, those the first three to five days. The recovery is dramatically different. This particular trial, we're the only site in Arizona that, that is activated in this trial. So people who have a leaky aortic valve who need an aortic valve replacement would come to our center and have this done. So we get referrals from Flagstaff, from Phoenix, from New Mexico, from Nevada that come to TMC here in Tucson to have this procedure done. Mayo Clinic sends us referrals because Mayo Clinic Scottsdale is not involved in this trial. Banner is not involved in this trial. So it's really exciting to, to, to really grow this footprint here at TMC and Pima Heart. The second trial is called Champion AF. This is a watchman device that you put in your heart for people who have AFib who cannot tolerate blood thinners. This cutting edge trial is now comparing it directly head to head to blood thinners. So that's really exciting. This is, this is the next generation of advanced AFib care. The next highlighted trial, for Corsinch, people who have congestive heart failure, we're in four different heart failure trials. This device helps the pump squeeze better. It changes the geometry of the left ventricle, your pumping chamber, to allow it to pump blood more effectively, if you will. It's a catheter-based device. I'll show you a picture of it. We have, if you have congestive heart failure, we have a couple of clinical trials in the office that we go and actually put a hole in the heart to relieve the pressure in the heart, called the LA Chef trial. So there's lots of new therapies. And again, with, with research, if you think about it, if you don't, if, if I if I practice what I learned in my training 20 years ago, you're, you're way behind, you're, you're yesterday's news, right? So we wanna be ahead of the curve. We wanna be the leading edge of the curve. And that's what research has brought to this community at TMC and Pima Heart. It allows us to, again, to advance therapies that are cutting edge, that are new device technologies that are guideline changing. These two trials, the three trials I just spoke about, are going to change the guidelines in cardiology. So we follow the American College of Cardiology. How are you doing? Good to see you. The American College of Cardiology, ACC AHA guidelines. And what we're doing here are trials that are going to change that paradigm with how we approach different types of heart disease. If you move down to the next red one on the list there, the High Life EFS trial. And it says EFS, that's early feasibility. So that's a technology that has limited human experience. We're in multiple EFS trials, including FIH, which is first in human. So this trial, High Life, we performed the first in human large annulus valve, which is a transcatheter, transvenous mitral valve replacement. Now keep in mind, surgeons have been opening the chest and doing mitral valve replacements for about 70 years. Okay. So this is a catheter-based valve implantation that takes about an hour and a half, and you go home generally the next day. A brand new heart valve. We did the first one in, in, in humans last July, and I'll show you that case actually. Here at TMC. Laminar EFS, that's another uh, LA pinage device like a watchman. I'll chat about that just briefly. Laplace EFS, that's an early feasibility tricuspid valve. So just like the High Life Mitra valve, we're doing tricuspid valve replacements through catheters, and folks are going home within 24 to 48 hours. It's remarkable where we're at in cardiology. We did see the FIH after this. We did the first in human, 
this past Monday here at TMC. So a patient came in of ours, had their tricuspid valve replaced through a transjugular venous approach, a brand new tricuspid valve implanted. That patient went home the next day. He was the first patient in the entire world to have that valve. And that was wow. done at TMC this past week. That's remarkable. Think about the centers here in Arizona. Honor Health, Banner, Mayo Clinic. In the US, you have Columbia, Cedar sinai Houston Methodist. This was done at TMC. The next one, Millipede, also in the yellow, first in human. We, that's a much of our repair system that the company actually shelved. We did the third implant in the world, and it was the first with an existing watchman. They decided they didn't want to invest, you know, half a billion dollars to grow this thing for 10 years, because that's what it takes. These, these industry folks, you have to give them credit. They invest about $550 million to get a new heart valve through the FDA studies over about an eight to 10 year period before it gets in our hands. That's remarkable. At TMC now, we're at the leading edge of that. We are the first folks being offered the opportunity to put these valves in. And I'll follow this valve over 10 years, watch it through all the pivotal trials, the FDA official approval, and then the commercialization of it. So some centers that don't have this opportunity, they won't see this valve for another decade. Mitral 2 is another important study for mitrals. Noble Stitch, another important study for PFO closures. Protected TAVR is a filter device we use during TAVR to prevent clot from going to the brain. And a TAVR is an aortic valve. So now we have mitral valves that are replaced percutaneously or catheter-based, tricuspids, and aortic valves. So we're really moving the, the space forward and doing it right down the street here. I'm going to focus now on, um, on the mitral space in general, and then I'll shift to AFib and, and uh, do a little bit about AFib. Um, of the trials in yellow, those are mitral replacements or mitral repair devices that are catheter-based. So all these, all these devices and studies you see, they're all catheter-based. They go through the groin, you go home generally the next day. So the recovery is dramatically different than conventional open thoracic surgery, which we still need. So what's happening is more and more people obviously want to have the catheter-based, the least invasive approach. But there's sometimes so many complexities with heart arteries that are blocked, with heart valves that are blocked. <clears throat> So you'll see that the surgeons that we use are going to be key, are going to become even more specialized, taking on those more challenging cases. So we'll be, there'll be a regionalization, I would predict, where fewer and fewer hospitals will, will offer conventional open surgery because the surgeons are going to be needed at very specialized centers like ours. If I can't master it and do it successfully with a catheter based, based on the anatomy, then I'll call my surgeon colleague and he'll do it open chest. It'll be higher risk, but that may be the only opportunity we have to offer the patient in terms of therapy. So it'll be it'll be very important going forward. We're very well with our surgeons. So of these trials, I'm going to highlight a couple of these. Accurate. This is a, a brand new tri, um, transcatheter aortic valve implantation that's in its pivotal trial called the IDE. This is what it looks like. This is delivered. It's crimped down on a tube. The tube goes through the groin. It's about a six millimeter hole in your groin. It's about the size of my pinky. Okay into the heart and a brand new valve is implanted. It takes about an hour. They go home the next day. Here's a picture of this. So this is a picture demonstrating what this valve looks like, how it sits in your aortic valve annulus. Keep in mind, your heart's a pump. It's pumping blood every cardiac cycle, every second or two. The gatekeeper, the main valve is the aortic valve. When that is too narrow, blood can't get ejected out to the rest of the body. That's called aortic valve stenosis. This is a new valve we put in and it replaces the old valve. We don't take out the old valves. We rely on the calcium of the old valves to anchor our valve. That's called a TAVR, a transcatheter aortic valve replacement, TABR. Alta valve, this is a mitral valve implantation. We go through the femoral vein in the groin, we go into the heart and put a brand new mitral valve in. This one's really unique. It's actually a cage. It's a nitinol cage. Nitinol is nickel titanium. This cage sits in the left atrium and the valve starts functioning below. So it's a ball and cage kind of technology. This is an early feasibility. So only a handful of people in the world have had this valve. That's a model of the first patient we did here at TMC. So we were the first center in the entire Southwest to do this procedure, first in Arizona. That's a model of the atrium of my patient. And we deployed it multiple times using 3D print technology. You guys have all heard of 3D print, right? Yeah, yeah. 3D print, well, we use it for cardiology. So I take the that's CAT scan, take the images, there's a machine the companies use. They make a silicon heart model 
of my patient and I practice my procedures on them multiple times before I do it in the body in vivo. We do ex vivo implants on their actual heart, which is remarkable technology in itself. It allows us to be better at what we do, get better results for you guys. Align R, I mentioned that's the tab R for a leaky aortic valve. So again, the aortic valve is the gatekeeper. The left ventricle is the pump. This is a valve that's stuck open. So you have stenotic valves are narrow valves. Regurgitant valves are leaky valves. They both manifest as congestive heart failure, where you have trouble breathing. Fluid backs up in your legs. You, you huff and puff and you exert yourself. You feel like you're just out of shape or, or winded quickly. That's how valves present. Now, when it gets late stage, then you get really fluid overloaded and you develop really severe congestive heart failure where they have to put a breathing tube in and maybe put you even on dialysis to take fluid off. So this is, we're the only site in Arizona. We get referrals from Mayo Clinic, from Banner Scottsdale, from Flagstaff, from New Mexico, all over. Because we're the only site in the entire Southwest doing this TAVR valve for a leaky aortic valve. This is what it looks like here. It's catheter based into the heart. Put this new valve in, it's called Jenna valve. This will probably be on label and FDA approved within the next year, I would imagine. It's just finishing up its major clinical pivotal trial. Uh, Champion AF, this is a trial for AFib using a Watchman implantation, which is a device to get you off blood thinners, compared head to head directly to blood thinners, which is the standard of care. How many people take a blood thinner? So, I mean, it's pretty common. Right, probably 25% of the adult population in Arizona is on a blood thinner. Blood thinners are blood thinners are blood thinners. Right? If you take a blood thinner, you're going to have a proclivity to bleed easier because your blood is thinner. Okay, this device replaces the blood thinner when you're taking the blood thinner for AFib. This trial is comparing itself directly to blood thinners, and it likely will be a very very important study. You'll see this probably in New England Journal in about another four years. It'll be on the front page. Champion F trial. If it is positive, this will change the American College of Cardiology guidelines likely. Uh, that's the Watchman device. <clears throat> and the newest one is called the Watchman Flex Pro, which is now medicated. Just like we put medicated stents in, now structural heart devices are becoming medicated. So this is the first one of its kind in the structural heart space where it's a medicated device you put in your heart other than a coronary stent. Came out last year. We were the first, one of the first centers in the country to put this in, uh, in our patients. It's called the Washman Flex Pro. Course Inch, um, first site in Arizona, the only site right now in Arizona. This is that device we put in, again, through a femoral artery into a weakened muscle that has congestion of heart failure. We deploy this device. We anchor it inside the myocardium, which is the muscle inside the heart, to allow the geometry of the heart to pump better. So you increase the squeezing function of the heart. Very, very unique tool. I think will become important. This with trials like we're doing at Pima Heart called Allay HF will help offload the pressurized system. It's a balloon you blow up when you're in heart failure, it's pressurized, the fluid level's too high in there. So we'll put a little hole in the septum in this trial called Allay HF and they'll get a device like a course inch. That's likely how we're gonna treat heart failure down the road. That's the device on x-ray, it looks like a C. Then we anchor it together and pull it tight under ultrasound imaging and x-ray to optimize the pump of the heart. Really unique device. I think this will have a big role. High Life EFS, I've talked about this. I'll show you the actual case we did, the first one in the world here at TMC. Catheter-based mitral valve implantation. First, we go through the aorta to put a ring in, and then we put the valve inside the ring to anchor it. And I'll show you the case here, but this is kind of a brief summary. The ring is on the left side, the valve is in the middle, and that's what it looks like. This is a top-down or surgeon view. When you cut off the top of the atrium and look straight down, you see the mitral valve. This is a brand new valve functioning on a 3D image on an echo. Here's this case here. So this is really, really important. So this can treat larger valves. The biggest issue we've had in the past is the valves have not been made big enough. This company treats up to a 5.3 centimeter valve, which is the largest in the space. So we did the first inhuman case in July 2023 here at TMC. And I, re I presented that I had the honor of, in, uh, of being invited to present this at London Valve, which is a, one of the biggest valve conferences in the world. It focuses just on catheter-based valves. So I flew to London uh, last summer and uh, presented this case on behalf of TMC. So I won't belabor you guys with the with history, but basically a gentleman with a leaky mitral valve who we felt was probably not a good open heart 
conventional candidate because of his age and his frailty. So we decided a catheter based valve is likely the best option for him. So this is us deploying that ring. So we'll go through the artery on one side, put a ring below the mitral valve. They come in the vein on the right side and put a valve right inside that ring to anchor that. So the valve is stable. It works very, very well. That's the ring deployment. Here's the valve implantation itself. So you see the image there on the left side on the x-ray? There's a ring there. You see a valve through the ring. We're deploying that valve now. So it becomes a valve and ring. The ring is like a, a door frame. Okay, it's a door frame. We're putting a new door in. We need a new frame to help us support that door. I'll show you the final result here. There it is. So that's the valve and the ring. And look at this. So this is called a ventricular gram. So what this is, is we put a pigtail catheter inside the left ventricle of the pump. We inject a picture with contrast. We see the squeeze of the heart, and we see how much is leaking backwards through the leak through the valve. So that valve is a completely competent valve, working very well. So on a scale of valve leakiness or regurgitation, zero, there's none, and four, it's bad. This patient had a four, we got it down to a zero in about an hour and a half procedure. And he went home the next day. So very, very remarkable. That's the valve itself, again, called High Life. Noble Stitch is a PFO closure device where we go through the groin, put a suture, catheter-based suture, to plug up holes in the heart. Shortcut is another very, very important tool. We're the only site in Arizona, again, with this trial. When I put those TAVR valves in, the transcatheter aortic valves, when you put it inside an old valve, you can create overcrowding, like Russian t doll. There, you put a big one and a medium one and a small one, the area gets smaller each time you put a new valve in. Okay? So that can cause a problem called patient prosthetic mismatch, where I put too small a valve in and you, feel, you still feel short of breath because there's, the hole's too small. Even though the leaflets are opening, the hole's too small. So this will help mitigate that because it allows to create a bigger space. It also, when you put these valves in, you can block off your heart arteries and reduce flow. You can have a heart attack during our procedure. This unique tool splits the old valve leaflets to make enough room we put the new valve in. Very, very important tool. Now, there's a conventional way to do this called basilica. It's a long and funny an acronym, but basilica is a high-risk procedure inside of a TAVR procedure that takes about two hours to do. Right, go on with balloons and wires, electrify the wires, puncture the leaflet, split the leaflet with heat energy, and then put the valve in. It's very archaic and very high risk. This tool has miniaturized that into about a 15 minute procedure. Wow. So I know this may be a little over your head, but just think about this, okay? A tavern takes about 45 minutes. Brand new aortic valve through the groin, go home the next day. When you add a basilica where I have to create space to put a new tavern in, adds two hours to my, that procedure. So now it's two hours and 45 minutes, okay? This tool takes 15 to 18 minutes from that two hours. So that's, that's what technology is doing for us. It makes it safer for the patient. You're under anesthesia less. You go home without risk of complications. So this is what we, why, this is why I'm very passionate about research. It expands device technologies, expands therapies, and offers patients safer, more efficacious procedures. Here's a picture of this. Really unique. It's a very simplistic design. So the pre-split on top is an old surgical valve that had failed. So we're going to put a tab inside that old surgical valve so the patient didn't have to have open surgery twice. Okay. So the bottom is the split. Any lay person can see that. You can see we actually split that leaflet. That split right there you see on the screen on the bottom left image takes about two hours to do the conventional way. Two hours, okay? With this tool, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes. And it's just as good. The results have been just as good. So that's that's really important. Tricent 2 is a transcatheter tricuspid valve that has now been commercialized. So we're in the trial called Tricent 2, led to the FDA to approve this valve two weeks ago. So it's the first valve ever in the U.S. that has been approved for tricuspid valve regurgitation. Surgical or catheter based. And we we're part of that trial. Here's a picture of that valve. It goes through the femoral vein. We go into the heart. We deflect this catheter. We go across the tricuspid valve. We deploy these nine little, ankle, little anchors. Those anchors grab the old leaflet. They cinch it down. We release the valve, and you have a brand new valve. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour. 
and we were, in, we were one of the early sites to be involved in that study. Um, good. So any questions so far? That's a lot. Yes, please. So I'm sitting here like everyone just went jaws dropping. <laughs> and you are doing all this through the catheter, which is a teeny, teeny thing. And you, you, you view it through a camera. I mean, I've been in the cath lab, but yeah. I think I know that you see where you're going on one screen because of the camera. Yep. Yeah. And then you're guiding it. How many times are you inside the heart? Yeah, so it depends on the procedure. So we, we are able to... Yes, absolutely. So the question is basically how do we navigate through the hearts and how do we see how many times we need to navigate? Um, for any cardiac procedure, there's usually two tools. The most common one is plain old x-ray. Okay. We use contrast dye to inject through catheters with a catheter placed wherever we want to see, whatever part of the anatomy. So if it's a heart artery, we put the catheter inside, put it in the vessel, inject contrast dye. The contrast dye then lights up under x-ray and I can see the vessel architecture, the path of the vessel. The second tool, which we use very commonly in structural heart, is an ultrasound, okay? Just like the ultrasounds you go with your cardiologist or OB or whoever, an ultrasound, an echocardiogram. It has technology where it's on a tube as well. We put the tube into the heart. It's called intracardiac echo. So I can use ultrasound inside the heart I can use ultrasound down your throat with a camera called a transesophageal echo. I can use ultrasound on your chest, which is called a thoracic or chest echo. So those three modalities are really important for heart valve implants. Go. And usually we go in, back to your question. We usually go, we visualize every time we go in and out, and we visualize whatever we're doing at that time. So usually we're always seeing something. Yes, question. I have two questions. Please. One is, as you do these very touchy placements, mm -hmm within the heart. Is it done in the operating room or the cath lab? Yeah. Secondarily, if it's done either place, is there a surgeon immediately on call for any hiccups or yeah. like it's not sitting nicely the way you want it? Exactly. So the question is, where do you do the procedures? And then is there backup? So uh, I'll start with the first one. We do them in a hybrid cath lab, which has the capabilities to open the patient if we need to, versus a conventional cath lab doesn't have the equipment for an open surgeon to come in and do open heart surgery if we need to. And yes, we always have a surgeon on call. Many of these are done with our surgeon standing beside us. We're doing the procedure and our surgeon's there for the valves. Now for angiograms and stents, less, less so. Those are, we, there's about a million cardiac procedures, cardiac angiographic procedures done a year in the US with stents, cardiac stents, about a million a year. So those are done at hospitals without backup surgery. There's a couple of trials that showed you could do it safely without backup surgery. If there is a rare complication, which in a heart stents about 1%, 1.5%, oh. very low, they can transfer them safely to a hospital that can do open surgery. Now, and for the most part of that mm -hmm. was these new valves mm -hmm. procedures, they're young, mm -hmm. they've gone through clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Do they have a short life expectancy because the evolution, the progression of the research makes them better and better mm -hmm. every time the pharmaceutical company yeah. produces one? That's a great question, so I'll repeat the question. Basically, she's asking, what, what is the durability of these heart valves? How long do they last? Um, it's a great question. So most tissue valves historically last about eight to 12 years, a bell-shaped curve, okay? Historically speaking, okay? Most of the new valves have anti-calcific therapy treatments on them that prevent calcification from occurring. So you'll see your valve will be anti-calcification coating or drug coating. There'll be some coating on the leaflets. For aortic valves particularly, they're very prone to calcification deposits, which leads to degeneration of the valve. So with that, we believe these valves are going to last closer to 15 to 20 years with the newest technology. Great question. Other question? Yes, please. Yeah, um, mine's a little bit less intense. Um, does insurance cover it? Yes. Yeah. So, so in terms of the clinical trials or the new technologies? For any of it. Yeah. If... So the question is about insurance coverage. So to have a clinical trial that's FDA approved, the sponsor, the company like a Boston Scientific or Edwards, they have to go through a pathway with the FDA and it's approved by CMS. So you have FDA approval and you have CMS approval. So most trials are not launched unless they have CMS approval. So your insurance would cover it. 
And what is the average age of your patients, and does a patient age out at a certain age? Um, average age, it varies. It depends on the therapy. If it's a watchman to get you off blood thinner, probably 65 to 70. If it's a heart valve, probably 75 to 80. And there's there's no limit in terms of therapies. We I've done a 92 year old, I've done a 102 year old. It all depends on what is their quality of life. If you're an invalid in bed, you only get up to use the restroom and eat, and that's it. Then I'm, I'm not. That's not somebody that's probably going to be treatable, or we would want to treat. But if you do what's called activities of daily living, you can get up, you can go shopping, go to the mall, go hang with friends, get a coffee. Your quality of life is okay. That's someone I pursue an intervention. So it's really about quality of life, right? Age is irrelevant in that regard. So you've had a patient 102. I've had 102. Yeah. Congratulations. 18 to 102. Yeah. It all depends on quality of life, right? It's really what it is. If you're an invalid in bed, then that's not for you. Yes, question? Do you get referrals from the VA? We do. Yep, we do. We offer a lot of therapies they don't have, unfortunately. But yes, we do. Yep. And now they have a, the VA of the last couple of years has allowed, admitted, has made it easier for you to go to um, community doctors. About two years ago, that was a big problem. We couldn't get approval for VA patients, and now they've made it much, much easier. Yes? What exactly is CMS? Can I get CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid, okay. the government who pays the bills, basically. So CMS pays health care through insurances. So when a, when a device is approved by CMS, then most private insurances will follow the CMS rule and guideline. There's a national coverage determination called an NCDR in cardiology. So when a new device is approved by the FDA, it has to have a payment plan, which CMS covers, and that gets extrapolated to most private insurance companies. But back to your, briefly to your point, we don't do these procedures unless we have prior authorization for insurance, yeah, research or not. Yes? You mentioned that these evolutions of the procedures are changing pretty quickly, especially the guidelines in cardiology. So how do the guidelines keep up with those who qualify for these particular, I don't know if they're experimental is the word, or just the investigational. Technology. Yeah, so the question is, how do the guidelines keep up? And the short answer is they don't, um, right? They're a couple of years behind usually. So it's mostly yeah. on an individual basis submitted to some kind of review committee that says this patient could qualify with benefit from this particular Right, procedure. so you're speaking specifically about the research trials, is that what you're asking? Well, I'm just thinking from the patient's perspective that wants to have a better ADL, basically. Yeah, so there's lots of pathways. So the guidelines are, are pretty strict about what we can do and can't do for commercial devices. We all follow the guidelines. It's evidence-based medicine. My point was the trials that we're doing now, unfortunately, like, for example, the TAVR valve for a line AR, that's a catheter-based valve for leaky aortic valves. That won't be approved for another year. The trial is now closed. So this next year, if you have a leaky aortic valve and you're 80 years old or 85, your options are high-risk open thoracic surgery or nothing, right? So that's what I'm saying. The guidelines lack a couple of years because the trial's closed. It's not yet FDA approved because the FDA has to go through all the data, do data mine to ensure that it's the best therapy, right? That's they can approve it. So that therapy gap is really, really important in clinical trials because I can't offer you anything other than open surgery. Again, if you're an octogenarian or an antigenarian, that's probably not the best therapy for you. So usually the guidelines are behind a couple of years. Now, investigational devices, we have the luxury of having a lot of these opportunities where there's another device trial that can get you involved in and get your valve treated. So that's why it's important. So it's competitive companies that make leaky valves for aortic valves, right? Mm -hmm. Towers for leaky aortic valves. So that's really important. And all of this research you've just iterated is pretty much on an adult population. Is only adult right? population. Yeah, it is only adults. 18 to 102. <laughs> exactly. You got it. Another question? Okay. You guys want time for more? Good time for more? I got about 30 more slides, so I can go all day. Okay. I'm going to just highlight the program one more time again. TMC with our PMO Heart and Ambassador team. We've done nearly 2,000 of these transcatheter aerobics started in 2013. Top 10% in the country. And um, we do about 300 a year now, probably 325 this year. Watchmen also pushing 2,000 this year. That's a device that we put in for AFib again that are high risk for bleeding. Uh, at one point last year, we were actually the busiest Watchmen implanting hospital in the entire country. 
I'll say that again. We are the busiest hospital in the entire country doing Watchmen. That's where you fit, right? Where you fit. There are 749 hospitals that do this procedure. We were the busiest last year. <laughs> we're always in the top five, but it kind of undulates with different programs on. Uh, mitral tier, which is a catheter-based repair system. We started in 2015, and uh, in 2020, in the height of COVID, we were actually number two overall in the entire world, the entire country. We've done about 305, now 306, structural heart investigation device implants. So those are new device technologies that are in clinical trials, that are FDA-approved clinical trials, that the FDA thinks is going to be something that's valuable in the future for patients. Other program highlights, as I mentioned, number one in Watchman last year, number two in Mitral Clip uh, two years ago. One of 11 sites selected worldwide for this novel mitral system called the Millipede. One of 10 sites worldwide for another mitral placement called High Life. One of two uh, sites worldwide for LA Closure, which is a Watchman-like device. One of two sites worldwide for the tricuspid valve, that's the catheter base through the neck. And between the TMC research program and our Pima Heart and Vascular colleagues, we have over 65 clinical trials. So basically, if you have a heart problem, we have a trial if you're interested in new device technology. I am the Thank you. I appreciate it. Took, took a couple eight years to get to this point. <laughs> took eight years a year. Yes, please. How about the nasty word of what can that patient expect postoperatively? Some complications? Yeah, so any catheter based procedure, the most common complication is going to be bleeding. We're accessing a vessel, either an artery or a vein, <laughs> and it can be a two millimeter catheter or a six and a half millimeter catheter, okay, mm -hmm. through the vessel. So bleeding is the most common. Now we put stitch, stitches, we put plugs, we put different closure techniques we use to, to see if that's probably the most common. That's probably about five to 10%. Heart attack, stroke, and death, the most feared are usually 1% or less. For watchmen, it's 0.4% or less. So most of these procedures, like a TAVO, for example, compared to open surgery, conventional open surgery, it's about 75% less risk of stroke heart attack or death, which makes sense, right? Open chest surgery versus catheter. I mean, it's 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 pretty uh, pretty arbitrary in terms of the concept of complication that regard. Okay, uh, a couple other highlights. Uh, we have done four first in the world implants called first in human or FIH, which one by itself is remarkable. Most centers never have the opportunity ever to do an FIH. If they do it, they go to some other country and do it in either South America or, or Asia. Um, top enrollers, top two, you can see for those three major clinical trials. We have, again, we have an inaugural structural heart disease where I train someone to be like me in their final year of that 15 year training period. So they have, they have the honor of joining us at TMC Cath Lab and PMR Vascular and do their uh, final year of training. Um, only 45 hospitals have that training program in the entire country. We have a post doctorate cardiovascular research fellowship where we train a physician or a physician to be to understand how to run these trials. So we're training one on each side, one to do the procedures and one to learn how to run the trials. So we have two separate fellowships. We graduated the first one in 2021. So the vision statement for us is really to become a top tiered structural heart disease program. And I think we actually are at that point now. I think we finally reached it this past year where when you have the Mayo Clinic calling you saying, hey, can you get this patient in one of your trials? I think that's what really speaks volumes. Um, and again, four first in human implants. Build a nationally recognizable recognized research program. I think we were doing that uh, at the PMART level and have done it at the TMC level. So we have two programs, one outpatient based and uh, one uh, hospital based, which is more focused on the large device implants. And graduated, you know, structural heart fellowships and research fellowships. And our motto has been sometimes you have to run first to understand how to walk better. Think about that. Sometimes you have to run first to understand how to walk better. When you have the inertia and the momentum, you go. When you lose it, you slow down, you recalculate and understand what you did and do it better. You learn how your ankle can articulate better with your leg, where your knee can articulate better with your hip. So the next time you have the energy to run, you can take a longer stride and accomplish more. Right, Mike. What's that? Yeah. Good. All right. I'm going to switch gears and show any case, any questions before I go to another case? 
Good. So this is a, a Watchman. So this is what I'm one of the my most passionate device implants. It's for people who have AFib that can't tolerate it. This is a way to get you off your blood thinner. This is a 76 year old gentleman uh, who had AFib, proxismal AFib. He had a Chad's VAS score. So if you have AFib, I would encourage you to learn your Chad's VAS score. It's a simple little test to determine what your risk of a stroke is and should you be on a blood thinner or not. So his was four, which means he should be on a blood thinner. He was intolerant to the blood thinner apixaban, which is eloquence. He had serious internal bleeding. So we decided to help him out. So this is where we're going to the heart with the catheter. We use fluoroscopy and we use ultrasound. We puncture a little small hole in the atrial septum. We put this device in. There's a wire going through. So this is under a trans esophageal cardio. I can see exactly millimeter to millimeter movement under this ultrasound. And I confirm with x-ray. That's called the left atrial appendage. That is where you form blood clots when you have atrial fibrillation. Those clots swirl around, they break off, and they go up to the brain and cause an embolic stroke. So AFib is one of the most common causes of strokes in folks over the age of 65. So we give them a blood thinner. They've been doing it for 70 years. The problem is, again, a blood thinner is a blood thinner is a blood thinner. You're going to bleed easier. If you're falling, you walk with a cane, you have an ulcer, you have a prior history of brain trauma, not a good idea to be on a blood thinner. So we do this procedure and close this little chamber off called the left atrial appendage. Now we're using x-ray. So ultrasound and x-ray are very complementary. They're synergistic for us to allow us to get the best result. Now I'm doing fluoroscopy where I take a picture with the catheter and eject down that little chamber. It looks like a werewolf almost. Then I put this little plug-in called a watchman. We do this because clots and AFib only seem to occur in that chamber. They've done multiple postmortem studies and in, in vivo studies to show clots and AFib never form in the atrium proper. They form a little side chamber called the left atrial appendage. If I sent you to open surgery for another reason, you had multiple blockages or you had a bad valve and needed to open our surgery, we'd tell our surgeon just to cut it off. It's a vestigial organ. It's like the appendix of the heart. You don't need it. Most people can live with it. But if you have AFib and you're not taking a blood thinner, the risk of forming a clot in that little chamber is about five-fold higher. And those clots are usually not small clots. Heart artery clots are usually two to three millimeters. These clots are two to three centimeters. So when they break off and go up, they cause massive hemispheric strokes. Okay? So it's important. If you have AFib, know your CHADS VAS score and either take a blood thinner or have a watch if you can't tolerate a blood thinner. Here's our angiograms, so and now we're shifting back, toggling back to you know, fluoroscopy. I have a great seal. That's the device release. That stays in your body. It's a one-time implant. Not like a pacemaker. You have to have the battery change every eight to ten years. This is a one-time implant. We do a camera or a CAT scan at 45 days. If it looks good, healed up, you're off your blood thinner permanently. And now you're protected from a stroke from AFib. This is a little flex ball. It comes out, forms a little ball. We implant it completely. It literally takes about 10 minutes to do it. But first, this is, a, this is a true story. So somebody was asking about experience. So when I started here eight years ago, I did the first Watchman in Tucson at TMC. I had a proctor come, a friend of mine from Scripps in San Diego, Matt Price, Dr. Price, fantastic guy. He was in the clinical trial and uh, Protect AF and, and those trials back in 2012. This was commercialized in 2015. We did the first one at TMC in 2016, first one in, 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 in Tucson. Guess how long it took me to do this procedure? Keep in mind, I do them now in about 11 minutes. An hour? We've got an hour. We've got two hours. Two hours. Mm -hmm. Any other takers? Mm -hmm. Two and a half? Mm -hmm. My smile's getting bigger. Mm -hmm. Any other takers? Mm -hmm. no. Three hours and 15 minutes. Wow. <laughs> Three hours and 15 minutes. And you, you knew now in like 15 minutes? Now we do them in 11 minutes. <laughs> what changed? And then it's time for coffee. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what changed was experience. So you have to be good at something, you have to do it. Yeah. You yeah. don't dabble, you don't do, so ask your doctor, they do a procedure, first thing I ask them, when I go see my doctor, I'm like, if it's a procedure, like, how many of these do you a year? That's so important, I'm telling you, experience speaks volumes. If you're doing one or two of these a year, it's gonna take you three hours. All right, we'll do 12 of these in a day at TMC. 12 in a day. So experience, absolutely. Right. Yes? What kind of uh, anesthetic is involved? 
So with Watchmen, we we general anesthesia. They're short, they're 15 minute procedures. We're shifting out a light sedation and doing them with ultrasound in the heart called ice. So it's a transition period right now. We're doing more and more of these with light sedation. They go home the same day. Probably 45 to 50% of folks we screen to go home the same day. Yeah. This is what it looks like. This is a, a 20 millimeter Watchman Flex Pro. The Pro again is medicated. So what's cool about this new device is that it's it has a medication which promotes healing. It prevents blood clots and promotes healing. It's fascinating. This is what it looks like at 45 days. It looks literally just like a cork in a wine bottle. Yes, please. That was my question. You had mentioned in the beginning that now they're medicated. Yes. When did they start that? September of 2023. Yeah. And we're in a trial looking at that called the HEAL LAA trial. It's a post market approval study looking at this long term. Because I have one, and now I'm thinking, do I have to get another no, one? No, no, no. <laughs> it's a one time implant. You don't need another one. Yeah. Yeah, great. So this is the uh, left atrial appendage. Can you show the watchman? Yep, I can. So this is the watchman right here. I'm sorry for the online audience that can't see, but it looks like the little uh, cork, if you will, on the right side of the image. So that little chamber that it's plugging up is the left atrial appendage. Clots so it's love. Instead of cutting it. If you want, right. So you, the point is, the question is, do you, you plug it, cut it, or or, or what do you, how do you close it? It doesn't matter how you close it. It's removing blood flow or preventing blood flow from going into it and forming clots. So when it comes out, it's not an embolic stroke. So if you went to open surgery, we generally have the surgeon. If the surgery's near that side of the heart, the left side, we have them cut it off and put a patch over it, a suture over it. There's a device that we can have them clamp it off. If we want to stay catheter based, then we do a watchman or its cousin called Amulet, where we go through the groin into the hearts and literally just plug it up. It's a plug based technology because that little chamber is a nice for blood clots. The question is it can be cut, plugged, stapled, hammered, however you can do it. The most common way is a watchman. And about 325,000 have been implanted worldwide. Yes, question. How long does that uh, medication last? It's permanent. Correct. Yeah. It's always doing something. No, what happens is the body heals over. So the medication of this device prevents clots from forming on it while it's healing. So you put this device in, there's a process where the body will grow over it, a cell layer over it called endothelialization. Endothelialization. Okay. Well, can you get a, a scrape on your arm, the body heals over, you get scar tissue. It forms a layer of scar tissue over the face of the device. Okay. What we don't want to have happen is have a fresh clot sit on that device before it gets to heal. Okay. The chances of that's about two to four percent with the old device. So the healing, the, the medication promotes that endothelialization or the scar tissue to form on it. So clots don't form on it when it's healing. It takes about six weeks. At six weeks, we'll do a camera, a scope, or a CAT scan. And if it's healed up, then you're off blood thinner permanently. Yep. Other questions? Yes. One last question. Please. All this robotics that's happening in the operating room, is robotics part of these technology advances? Great question. No, not for our program. <laughs> it's all catheter based still. Robotics, again, like anything else, you have to do a lot of it. Um, it's, a, it's, a different, it's a different approach, but it is good at some facilities that do lots of it. But we don't do robotics for this. These are all catheter based. I like to have the human touch because I can feel if I'm feeling resistance or if I feel like I'm not in the right spot. I quickly can make a change and maneuver around it. And most of the new trials are not robotic based. So this is at 45 days. It looks like it's healed up nicely there. You can see the device. I'll point over here on the screen. This is the watchman right here, this little donut looking thing. It literally just plugs up the, the left atrial appendage and I'm going to blood thinner. The patient did well, discharged home on blood thinners and uh, had complete endothelialization. This is at uh, intra the index procedure, day zero, and this is at uh, the follow up. At nine at forty five days. Question. Was it red cell? Is that why? <laughs> no, this is just the architecture around the left atrium. No, that's just the artifact there. Yeah. That's just the, the wall of the heart, the yellow red blood. You don't see blood on these images. Okay, it's very successful. The older trial of the device pre September twenty twenty three was this good. I mean look at this, its vet rate was 0.5%. At our center, it's 0.4%. Event rate meeting stroke, heart attack, death, major complications, 0.5%. We're at 0.4%.
Successful closure, 100%. Procedural success and discontinuation of blood thinner, all 96 to 100%. Very, very good. What you don't want to do is put a device in and have it not perform how you would expect it to perform. You want to put a watchman in and have it undersized so when you check it at six weeks, there's still a big leak on one side. It's not serving a purpose, right? So again, experience matters. Um, again, a registry that just showed the complication rate has been as low as 0.37%. So it's very, very safe, very effective for AFib patients. So let me ask a question. Please. Um, <clears throat> I, had a, I had AFib and I needed a, a conversion. Yep. All right, so now my doctor said, well, maybe next time we do, want to do an ablation. Yep. So do you guys do ablations? We do ablations. So ablations are for people that have symptomatic AFib. Okay. You can have AFib that is asymptomatic and AFib that's symptomatic. Both of them require blood thinners. Ablations we reserve for people that are symptomatic. They feel their chest, they feel AFib all the time, or they short of breath, they get chest pain, right? That's symptomatic AFib. Those patients I would refer for an ablation. We have electricians that are our, our partners that do the ablations. But electrophysiologists. Okay. But even if you have an ablation, you still have to take a blood thinner. Okay. 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 Because ablation's success rate varies from 65% to 95%. Right. And it's hard to predict who gets the best results. That's why the guidelines are very specific about taking a blood thinner afterwards. All right. We'll ablations for folks that uh, have Dr. Wagner, yes. I actually had a question come in asking specifically about ablations and AFib issues, asking if there was anything to replace that. So the question is, is there anything to replace ablations? No. Well, I'll, I'll say this. Medications can, but the antiarrhythmic medications that are generally available are very, very toxic. Most of them have significant side effects. And they can't be taken for long periods of time. So ablation has now moved up to a first-line therapy for symptomatic AFib. Again, symptomatic meaning you have palpitations that are really affecting your quality of life. You get up in the morning, your heart's just beating out of the chest and you can't do anything very well. Then it's a good ablation. If you have AFib and you're in AFib and you don't feel it and you live your normal life, leave it alone. You can live with AFib. Okay? As long as you're on a blood thinner or have a watcher. Okay, I do have another question. Please. Um, a T T R S C M. Yep. Okay. Um, is one of the side effects is you get um, Couple of tunnel syndrome. Yep. And, and my like my right thumb is like really, you know, it's really like it's kind of weak. Yeah. I mean, so should I see a, a hand doctor who had taken care of? I would. I would. Yeah, I would see a hand doctor. That's one I want to hear. Good. All right, moving on here, wrapping up here, guys. In summary, uh, for the watching program, we're very, very successful. We were actually again nationally uh, the busiest in the entire country in 2022. At all time, we're in the top 10. The surpass registry was really remarkable. And the latest trials, the HLA trial, which we're a part of. We got a whole bunch of folks here that I want to thank. This is our team here, <laughs> team at TMC, our team at uh, Pima Hearts. Okay, We've done 72 novel device implants at TMC. 72 in the last eight years. I'll leave it at that. Questions for me? Um, we'll go with the online ones that have come in. Okay. Um, yeah, so I just have a couple of questions that I wanted to ask you, Dr. Wagner. Um, what, with the, what is the survival rate for all of these first times, right? All of these new, new devices is there. I, I know you mentioned that it, it's been very successful. Are you, yeah. so you're seeing that there is it's a, it's a really good path to take. Yes, yeah, right? so rates have been 98% or better. Really, okay. really Great. And then what does the recovery look like for some of these implants, like for the TAVR or for the Watchmen? Yeah, so most patients go home the next day. For Watchmen, we've been trying to push them to go home the same day. So there's a lot of centers now that are doing same-day discharges for Watchmen. So for mitrals, aortics, tricuspids, they stay at least one day in the hospital. You go home, you take it easy for about five days, so no heavy lifting. We say five pounds or less the first five days. We see you in clinic, either myself or our NP. If the groins look good and you're on the good medications, then usually you're unrestricted within a week. But most go home post op day one. And do they do, uh, is cardiac rehab something that they would do afterwards as well? So if they have a history of congestive heart failure, which most folks with valve disease do have, or heart disease or heart attack, we do recommend cardiac rehab. 
That's in our guidelines. Absolutely. Outpatient care. Yep. Great. Um, if anybody wants uh, to make an appointment, I did want to go ahead and put up the information as well um, for Pima Heart and Vascular. It's 520-838-3540, or you can go to pimaheartandvascular.com for more information. Um, and I want to thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to wrap it up with our online audience, and I'll turn it over so that you can answer any additional questions in person. Thank you so much for being here today. Hey, my pleasure, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks thank for your time. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.